thank you very much, uh, Macau, and also thank you very much, Anthony. Um, I feel in a in a in a very bad position because um, actually I agree with you, uh, Macau. It's time um, to think and reflect. And um, whereas uh, I'm sitting now in the position to continue talking, um, but we want to profit from your both your presence here and um, take us another like 20 minutes um, to discuss a little bit um, the many topics you covered. Um, to begin with one question to you, Anthony. Um, in both your book but also today, you asked the question how to make international law, law useful. And in your book, in your conclusions, you are talking about the you're asking who, which are the agents who can promote this, this, this issue, who, can, who are promoting global justice. And uh, I would like to know from you who are our, our allies here and now um, to move towards global justice and use law in, in a good sense. Uh, well, <laughs> that's a very large issue, and um, I, I didn't feel really confident about uh, being able to address it in my book. But I, I do think that we have to adopt a very broad perspective on this, and I think uh, it goes back to some of the things that Macau says, that we shouldn't see a particular position as the location of power <laughs> in, these types of, uh, in these types of circumstances. I do feel that trail is important because my hope is that uh, people, I feel most people are people of goodwill. That if they happen to be working in particular institutions, uh, the World Bank or the IMF or whatever it is, and if they give some thought to these types of issues, they might rethink what they do, just as people at, in NGOs or development agencies, that these people actually might consider what they do in a more critical way. And what the outcome of that would be is something I can't be very clear about. Um, one of the most, uh, well, I, I was very touched uh, some years ago when um, somebody wrote to me saying something like, um, I've worked in international development for many years, and I wish I had read your book at the time I began this type of work. And I felt it was very good of them to well, firstly, I felt, of course, you know, uh, honored that they should think that my work was useful because it's very theoretical, but at least it develops a sort of um, a, a particular idea of practice. But I do see this as being people everywhere. I don't see any particular agents of change. Now, I think there's a sense sometimes that we feel if only we could get to the Supreme Court or if only we could get to the ICJ or if only we could get to this particular location of power. At one time, uh, you know, I was thinking, well, if I can work for an international organization, then somehow I can change the processes by which this can take place. I'm very glad that many 12 people are actually very practically involved, like Macau, uh, like my, our colleague James Gathy, like our colleague Obiora Okafor, who's somewhere here. You know, he's working within the human rights system. But I do think there isn't an easy answer to, to that to say there's one location, one decisive location of, of power, or that there's one particular actor. Uh, who can play a crucial role in this. You know, we might think, oh well, if only I can become President of the United States, then I'll change the whole posture of the United States internationally and so forth. It did not really work for you know, President Obama. <laughs> there are the, so it's all very diffuse, and I, I, I feel we can't really say there's any particular location. I think everyone can make some contribution, but it's difficult to predict. And I would also go back to what Macau said in terms of, you know, we have to think of the political. It's, it's, it's in all in the realm of political activity. Reparations, for example, so much of it is driven by a political process, not the law. <laughs> so I think we should see it in, the, in that broader sense, and I think that's one of the good things about this event, that we have a very broad community of people concerned about this issue, but approaching it from very different locations and positions. Thank you. Um, that you just talked about your general doubts in law, um, which, which I agree to, and you said that the human rights movement has to be politicized and, and look much more to economy than it did before, and uh, their, their, their um, big achievement was 
um, the uh, scandalizing the the despotism, but now the next step um, has to has to come. But don't you think that, particularly in countries like South Africa or like India, and we will hear more about India tomorrow, there are social movements who try to use the law as a tool, but not only not as the only tool, not hoping for the one instance, the one judge, the one court, but using a court, for example, like 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 you, Esther, and and the others in New York, um, using courts to put an issue on the table again, using courts to trigger discussion, you, using courts, using lawsuits, losing, using legal discussions as defense lines, like, like the absolute prohibition of torture as a defense line. So um, isn't, I, I, I agree with your critique, but aren't there movements right now who, are, who already overcome that, you know, that very naive and restricted view, uh, focused view on, on law. Um, <clears throat> no, so I, I think that if um, you are a, you know, young law school student and you are thinking about what law classes to take, uh, in the United States, uh, human rights is an elective. It is not something that is, uh, required, you know, you have to think about what course you're going to take. Um, uh, some civil rights courses uh, are also elective and so on. You know, and what I've always taught my students uh, is to think of legal education, at least in the United States, as a theater of, exp of experimentation, of uh, trying to get uh, scales to do multiple things, to do many things. Um, because legal skills are not simply skills as far as I, you know, as far as I teach law, uh, not about, just about traditional lawyering, or looking at, uh, concretely at documents and so on. It's about thinking broadly about society. And I think of lawyers, or I like to think of lawyers as intellectuals. You know, this is why I'm not interested in a narrow reading of the law. Um, if, if we take that perspective, uh, I have to say that, um, that each one of us must take a slice of the problem. You know, as we come out of law school, um, each one of us must take a slice of the, slice, slice of the problem. So in 2015, for example, I, I went to work for the World Bank for a year. And part of my brief there was to help the bank um, develop a human rights policy or human rights guidance. I did not succeed. <laughs> uh, but I tried, okay? Um, I have worked with uh, you know, colleagues in India who are interested, for example, in decriminalizing homosexuality. You know, thinking about that as a terrain of contest, all right, uh, and using the courts for that purpose. I do not impugn those efforts. I think they are great efforts. Uh, what my argument really is, uh, is about if you're a big tree trunk that you want to bring down, it might be the, the, the tactical thing to do might be to plow around the trunk first, you know, to weaken it so that you can go for the roots at some point, you know. But do not forget that the trunk is not going to be taken away by your plowing around it. At some point, you're going to have to face the tree trunk mano a mano, okay? And the question for me is, is for us, because I think that the, the use of the law is the plowing around the tree trunk. What, what skills are we imparting to our students in the legal academy to be able not just to plow around the tree trunk, but to take on the tree trunk itself directly at some point? And I think that not very much. We're not doing very much. You know, so that's, that, that, that's, that's, that, 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 that's part of the answer. And I think part of the problem is that you know, we, we as academics, but also as activists, 
We have not applied ourselves intellectually to that question. We really haven't. We've accepted certain boundaries uh, as no-go areas or as givens, and so therefore we don't go there. And we don't go there because we think that either it's futile or it will not succeed, or that it has no support. Um, uh, you know, so even on the question of trying to understand the, uh, the question of economic and social rights or globalization or land rights in South Africa, for example, even on that question alone, we are afraid to question the notion of private property as lawyers. And that was, in my view, the biggest bottleneck in South Africa. Okay? If you have you know, black people who you know, were um, um, uh, you know, uh, using land that was not theirs, okay, and they're being kicked out of that land, the landowner who is mostly white has a right to kick them out. And the Constitutional Court of South Africa is unable to do anything about that. Because the right to property is absolute. And when this particular, there was a case, in fact, in South Africa, the Groot Boom case, those who know this, South Africa know this very well, that case came before the courts in South Africa. It came before Justice Arby Sachs. I'm sure you all know Arby Sachs. And Arby Sachs told us, and I don't think I'm, 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 I'm giving out uh, private information, he said that when they heard the case, there was nothing they could do for those landless blacks who had invaded that uh, white-owned land, which they were not using. And this white landowner had hundreds and hundreds of acres, just lying fallow, just lying fallow, okay? So the question is, I'll be sacks that they heard the case and the, and the Constitutional Court basically could not do anything. Uh, I think the Constitutional Court asked them to go to mediation to see whether they would be allowed to stay there for a few more years as uh, something else was, 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 you know, was developed. So those are some of the challenges. Are we willing, for example, to confront that question? And I'm not, I'm not an outlandish individual here saying that I want to abolish private property. I'm not. But I'm just saying that there are issues that require that we rethink some of these fundamental principles. And who is willing to do it? Unless we are willing to do it, then I don't think that we are serious. So what do you think? I think these were very good and impressive last words for this panel, and we deserve a break. So thanks again, Marco. Thank you, Anthony. And we meet in 20 minutes for the next panel on development, development policy, asymmetrical trade relations, and global financial system, exactly continuing at that point you just made. So thanks again, and see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs>